Hello again, everyone. Um, so this is the final topic that we'll cover uh, as a lecture. Um, so the topic is knowledge and probability. Um, and so the basic question here is, there's a, there's a concept namely knowledge uh, that is very central to uh, traditional epistemology. So many of you will have taken a course in traditional epistemology and looked at various accounts of knowledge um, and the discussions over scepticism, sort of how much can we know? Uh, are we uh, uh, wrong about how much we know uh, in when we uh, claim to know things in everyday life because of sceptical scenarios? How do we understand knowledge? Uh, is knowledge justified true belief or is it uh, to be accounted for in other terms? Um, on the other hand, when it comes to formal epistemology, uh, knowledge hasn't traditionally been so central. Um, as we've seen, what's been central is uh, degree of belief, credence, and the justification for one's degrees of belief. So I think it's sort of natural to ask, well, um, how do these things relate? How do, does uh, knowledge relate, for instance, to a justified degree of belief? Um, and it t turns out that the answer's really not straightforward, um, which raises an interesting question. So given that it's not easy to relate them, uh, can they still happily coexist? So um, is it worth preserving both our concept of knowledge and of degree of belief? Or does is there really some inconsistency between these notions uh, that suggests that we actually ought to abandon uh, one in favour of the other? So this is a, a, an interesting topic um, that, that we'll devote our attention to uh, in this lecture. Okay, so the basic tension is brought out uh, by the so-called lottery paradox, um, which we will go on to examine in just a moment. Uh, but before examining this in detail, it's worth thinking in general terms about knowledge and about whether having knowledge of something, some proposition A, implies that one has a credence or degree of belief of one in it. So that's a kind of natural first pass suggestion that might come to mind. Um, if, if you're asked what the relationship between degree of belief and knowledge is, you might say, um, well, maybe... Um, to know something is to have degree of belief one in it, uh, and uh, for that degree of belief perhaps to be suitably justified. But actually, there are grounds for wondering whether this implication holds, uh, whether knowledge does indeed imply credence one. And I think there's sort of good reasons for thinking that, that it doesn't, um, because in fact, most of the things that you'd ordinarily ordinarily claim to know, or that we'd ordinarily say that we know, probably aren't associated with credence one. That is to say, at least if we were pressed on what our credence in these propositions was, or if we were forced to take bets, um, then we wouldn't uh, express a credence one, and we wouldn't bet as though we had credence one. Um, so, for instance, take something that I take it that I know, namely that Boris Johnson is the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Um, I think I know this. Uh, I'd ordinarily say I know this. It would be sort of odd for me to deny that I know this. But isn't there some chance, albeit perhaps a very small one, that Boris Johnson should have happened to have resigned, say, since I last checked the news. 
And it does seem that the, there is at least some such probability. So if pushed, um, then with this in mind, I may well not report a credence, one, uh, that he's prime minister, and I might uh, reasonably not bet as though I had credence one in this. Um, we can give other examples. Do I know Caracas is the uh, capital of Venezuela? Um, yeah, I think I know this. Um, but, I, you know, I don't assign literally zero credence to having misremembered this or um, having got confused about this or uh, the Venezuelans having taken an emergency measure to shift their capital since I last checked the news. Uh, so you could sort of multiply examples along these lines, all of which suggest that perhaps uh, knowledge doesn't imply assigning a probability or credence one to a proposition. A second related reason for doubting that knowledge implies degree of belief one is that it actually seems that we're more certain about some things that we claim to know than other things that we would claim to know. So, for instance, I normally say that I know that Boris Johnson is prime minister, uh, I'd also ordinarily say that I know that 2 plus 2 equals 4. But it's quite plausible, and if if asked, I would surely say this, that I'm more certain that 2 plus 2 equals 4 than that Boris Johnson is currently Prime Minister. Uh, after all, there's... With the case of Boris Johnson, there's, there's, as I said, there's at least some possibility uh, that he's resigned since I last checked the news. Whereas it's not possible that uh, since I last checked, 2 plus 2 should have stopped equaling 4. But it seems that if I'm more certain of some things uh, that... I know, or at least I'd ordinarily say I'd know, I know, than others, then they can't all have the same credence. Um, and so, so at least some of them must get credence less than one. And that kind of seems right because I'd be willing to bet more um, or a, a less favourable odds um, on 2 plus 2 being equal to 4 uh, than I would on um, Boris Johnson currently being the Prime Minister. Okay, right. So there's a, there's a sort of strong temptation to deny that knowledge implies credence one. And to sort of reinforce this, uh, it's worth pointing out that if we say, strictly speaking, knowledge does require credence one, then this implies that almost all of my ordinary claims about not what I know are false and seems to lead to a kind of radical scepticism that we might wish to avoid. But suppose we want to allow that knowledge doesn't imply credence one then this gives rise to a, a problem, uh, which is known as the lottery paradox. So, the lottery paradox can be introduced as follows. So, suppose that I buy a ticket for a lottery that consists of 100 tickets. Uh, let's suppose my ticket is ticket number one. Now, the lottery is going to be decided uh, by pulling a number between 1 and 100 out of a hat at random. So, it seems, in terms of the objective probability, the objective probability of my ticket winning is 0 0.01, 1 in 100. And correspondingly, there's a 0.99 probability, objective probability, that my ticket's going to lose. 99 out of 100 it will lose. And I know this. Um, now, the question is, do I know 
that my ticket will lose. Now, even though I have a reasonably high degree of belief that it will lose, it sounds rather odd to say that I know my ticket will lose. Um, and it seems difficult to explain my behaviour in buying a ticket uh, if we think that I, I know that it will lose. Now, on top of this, we can actually give an argument that I don't know that my ticket will lose, uh, rather than just um, relying on intuition. Um, this replies. This sorry. This relies on a principle known as knowledge closure, um, which says that if an agent knows proposition A, and the agent also knows proposition B, then the agent knows the conjunction of these two propositions. That is, the agent knows A and B, or at least would if she gave proper consideration to whether A and B is true. Now, knowledge closure seems at least reasonably hard to deny. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, certainly it's, it's very, it would be very puzzling um, a view that denied this. Um, but assuming it, and also assuming that knowledge doesn't imply credence one, gives rise to um, a, an issue. Right? So consider the proposition. So we're supposing for the sake of argument, or we're supposing um, in order for reductio, in other words, to show um, that um, this is a problematic assumption, Suppose that I claim that I know that ticket one, my ticket, will lose. Right. And so this is going to be an argument that uh, I, in fact, don't know that my ticket will lose, um, uh, despite having high credence in it. So suppose, so, uh, consider the premise that I know that ticket one will lose, which happens to be my, my ticket. Now... I also know that each ticket in the lottery has an equal probability of losing. Um, so it seems very plausible that premise two here holds, um, that if I know that ticket one will lose, then I also know that ticket two will lose. Um, that seems plausible. After all, they have the same probability. So it seems difficult to understand how I could know that ticket one would lose without will lose without knowing that ticket two will lose. And in, we can generalize this reasoning. So if I know that uh, ticket one will lose, then I know that ticket n will lose, where n is any value between two and a hundred. Now note that it follows from premise one that I know ticket one will lose. And premise two, if I know that ticket ticket one will lose, then I know that ticket two will lose. Uh, this intermediate conclusion or lemma that I know I know that ticket two will lose follows. So from P one and P two, lemma L one follows uh, as a matter of deductive logic. And more generally, from premise one that I know that ticket one will lose. And uh, this set of premises, um, uh, which I've designated PN, that if I know ticket one will lose, then I know that ticket N will lose for any N between two and a hundred. Um, it follows this more general lemma holds that I know that ticket N will lose, um, where, as I say, N is any uh, integer between two and a hundred. Now, by the knowledge closure principle, it follows from P1 that I know that ticket one will lose, and the lemma that I've derived that I know that ticket two will lose, um, that this holds, 
that I know that Ticket 1 and Ticket 2 will lose. So um, I know Ticket 1 will lose by P1. I know uh, Ticket 2 will lose. I've derived that. Um, assuming we hold onto knowledge closure, which says that if I know proposition A and I know proposition B, then I know uh, the proposition A and B. So this is just an instance. If I know that ticket one will lose and I know that ticket two will lose, then I know the conjunction that ticket one and ticket two will lose. Uh, and that's just what this lemma or intermediate conclusion is saying. Okay. Now, obviously, we've shown that really for any n, we can infer that um, I know, on the assumption that I, I know that ticket one will lose, that I know that ticket n will lose. So it also follows that I know that ticket three will lose. Um, but then from the fact that I know that ticket one and ticket two will lose and the fact that I know that ticket three will lose, we can again apply knowledge closure and get the further intermediate conclusion that I know that ticket one and ticket two and ticket three will lose. And basically, we're just going to repeat this process of inference, this pattern of inference. Um, so we can infer, for instance, that I know that ticket one and ticket two and ticket three and ticket four will lose all the way until we get to 100. Um, so if I go through each of these steps in turn laboriously, then we finally reach a conclusion that I know that ticket one and ticket two and ticket blah, 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 and ticket 99 and ticket 100 will lose. Um, and given that I also know that uh, there are only 100 tickets, this is equivalent um, to my knowing that uh, no ticket will win, right? All tickets, all the tickets in the lottery will lose. But that conclusion contradicts something that I take myself to know, and indeed I'm sure I know from the setup of the, the lottery, namely that one ticket will win. So in other words, from our assumption that I know that ticket one will win, which was my ticket, and what seemed like some other reasonable premises, uh, namely premises of the form, if I know ticket one will lose, then I know ticket n will lose, uh, for an integer between two and a hundred, and also knowledge closure, we've derived this conclusion that I know that all the tickets will lose, which can't be right. Um, because I, I, from the setup, I know that one ticket will win, and I can't both know that one ticket will win and that all the tickets will lose. So by reductio, it seems that it must follow that I don't know that ticket one will lose. So we must deny it, it's quite plausible um, premise one. At least we must deny it if we think that um, uh, premises like this hold. If I know that ticket one will lose, then I know ticket n will lose. And assuming we endorse knowledge closure. So that's an argument that in spite of your high degree of belief that your ticket will lose, uh, you don't actually know that your ticket will lose. Okay, so you might think, well, what's the problem? It's quite plausible that I don't know that my ticket will lose. Um, so why have you made such a big deal about giving an argument that I don't know it? Well, precisely because of the earlier fact that we mentioned, that there seem to be many things that we do know or claim to know, even though when pressed, we'd admit that our credence in them is less than one. And indeed, in this case, my credence in my ticket winning 
uh, oh, sorry, my ticket not winning uh, was 0.9. Oh, sorry. My credits and my ticket not winning was 0.99. And we've concluded, we've nevertheless concluded that I don't know that my ticket won't win. However, there seem to be plenty of things that I would ordinarily think of myself as knowing, such that my credence in them is actually lower than my credence in my ticket not winning, which we said I don't know. So, for instance, um, I'd say that I know that my local Tesco is open right now, um, even notwithstanding uh, current issues over coronavirus. Um, I, I think I know that, right? So it's the policy of the store to remain open. It's uh, during normal working hours. Uh, it's not been uh, prevented from opening by government policy. But probably if pushed, I'd say that my degree of belief is actually less than 0.99. You know, after all, I guess, when push comes to shove, I assign some credence to, for instance, um, the, the store having had to be quarantined or something because of coronavirus. So the question is, can, it seems, well, the issue is that it seems that I, difficult to consistently maintain that I know that my local Tesco is open if we also deny that I know that my ticket won't win. After all, my credence that my ticket won't win is actually higher um, than that my uh, local Tesco, my credence that my local Tesco is open. And so you might think, well, um, okay, knowledge doesn't require a degree of belief, one. Um, but maybe you might say, well, strictly speaking, I don't know that my local Tesco is open either. Um, you might think in general actually what's required for knowledge, or necessary condition for knowledge at least, is that one's degree of belief reach some threshold that happens to be greater than 0.99. So you might say, yeah, okay, you don't know your local Tesco is open, m m you know, and, and you might say, well, you know, given that you don't know that it hasn't been quarantined and there's actually a reasonable risk of that happening in present circumstances. You might say, okay, it's acceptable to say that actually you don't know. Um, just as it's perfectly acceptable to say that you don't know that your ticket will lose. And that's because, you know, although your credence um, was pretty high um, in each of those propositions, and although you had reasonable justification uh, for that credence, um, you might say, well, you know, it's just going to reach a higher threshold. Your degree of belief has to have a, uh, a reach a higher threshold for you to know a proposition. But, but actually, this doesn't seem to work, and that's because for any threshold below one that we might specify as a necessary condition uh, for knowledge we can rerun a lottery argument to show that the threshold isn't sufficient. All that we are required to do is to increase the number of tickets in our lottery appropriately. So, for instance, if I said, actually, the, the threshold um, degree of belief that's necessary for knowledge isn't 0.99, but rather it's 0.999, um, well, then we just need to imagine rather than a 100-ticket lottery, a 1,000-ticket lottery. Um, now, it still seems right, I take it, to say that even in a 1,000-ticket lottery, I don't know that my ticket won't win. Um, and we can give uh, a lottery paradox style argument, uh, well, a lottery paradox argument, just strictly analogous to the one 
uh, that we introduced earlier um, to show that I don't know that my ticket won't win even in this thousand ticket case. And indeed, even if I have a Euro Millions ticket, um, where the chance of my ticket winning is less than at one in a hundred million, it still seems right to say that I don't know my ticket won't win. Um, and again, we could just extend the lottery argument uh, to seemingly demonstrate that I don't know that my ticket won't win. But the problem is that many things, probably almost all the things that I'd ordinarily claim to know, um, for instance, that Boris Johnson's prime minister, that Caracas is the capital of Venezuela and so on, are ones that if I were pushed to state my credence in or to bet on, would receive a credence um, less than um, uh, uh, 0.9999999, which is um, uh, 99 million, uh, 999,999 out of 1 million, 100 million. So, um, in other words, the uh, almost anything that I would ordinarily claim to know um, is such that if push came to shove, I'd uh, assign a credence to that is in fact lower than my credence that I won't win the Euro, or my ticket is not a t winning ticket to Euro millions, um, even though I think it's right to say that I don't know that my ticket is not a winning Euro millions ticket. Okay. So there seems to be this tension between the desire um, to allow that knowledge doesn't imply credence one, based on the fact that most things we ordinarily would say we know, we don't have credence one in, or at least we wouldn't um, if pushed to give a credence assignment, assign credence one to. And on the other hand, the fact that for any credence less than one, we can give an example of a proposition uh, concerning a ticket losing in a lottery with the appropriate number of tickets that has the same or higher credence, uh, but that we do not wish to say that we know. Um, and this is essentially the lottery paradox. Okay. So, what are the responses um, to the lottery paradox? Uh, so, this tension between wanting to allow that we can have knowledge where we don't assign credence one, um, but also finding that we can, uh, for any threshold below one, we can find a proposition that exceeds the threshold, but that we don't in fact know. So there, I guess there are a number of possibilities for responding to the paradox. So you could just take a kind of hard-nosed approach and say, look, knowledge implies credence one. Um, so uh, this, me, this vindicates the fact that we don't know that our ticket loses, no matter how big the lottery. Um, but the problem is, as I've already described, um, this uh, would basically result in ruling that um, we don't know almost any of the things that we ordinarily claim to know. Um, so it seems that to, to endorse this response would be to endorse a rather severe form of scepticism. So many people at least don't find this particularly appealing. Okay. All right, so you might say an alternative response would just be to say, well, okay, you do know your ticket will lose, um, no matter how big... Uh, uh, sorry, you do know that your ticket will lose, 
um, as long as the, the lottery is a reasonable size. So, you know, maybe 100 tickets or more. Um, now, obviously, this is problematic in light of the... Um, uh, this is this is problematic in light of the lottery argument, um, and also it just seems sort of counterintuitive to say that your, uh, you know, your ticket will lose, um, and if you do know your, if it is right that you know that your ticket will lose, it's it's hard, as mentioned previously, to rationalise your behaviour of buying a ticket to the lottery. It's hard to explain that, uh, given we grant you know that the ticket will lose. Um, but, you know, it's not obviously inexplicable or irrational um, to participate in the lottery. Um, also, an, another point um, or worry about uh, the strategy of just claiming that you do know your ticket will lose in this case. Um, it's pointed out by Bradley in the, the uh, reading uh, on this topic. Um, and he, said, he points out that there seems to be a clear disanalogy between holding a ticket for tomorrow's lottery and holding a ticket for yesterday's lottery. Um, supposing that you've checked your ticket for yesterday's lottery and, in fact, it didn't win. So there's a sort of temptation to say, well, you really know that your ticket for yesterday's lottery isn't a winner, uh, which suggests that you don't really know that your ticket for tomorrow's lottery isn't a winner. Now, there's another worry for this strategy of just claiming that you know your ticket will lose. Um, and I suppose that's best seen by imagining a two-ticket lottery. Now, surely in the case of two-ticket lo lottery, you wouldn't want to say that you know that your ticket will lose. After all, there's a 50% chance that it will win. So someone who defends this claim that you know your ticket will lose for larger lotteries faces a problem of specifying a threshold number of tickets above which you know your ticket will lose. And any threshold we care to specify seems rather arbitrary and it's not clear how to motivate it. So. What about when there are four tickets and there's a 75% chance that your ticket will lose? Or is it uh, when there are 10 tickets, so a 90% chance? Or is it when there are 100 tickets, so a 0.99 uh, chance, and so on? So there are, there are sort of concerns about that strategy. A, a third option would be to say, well, the lottery paradox reveals a deep tension or inconsistency in our concept of knowledge, which shows that we should reject the concept of knowledge and its applicability to the world and just deal with degrees of belief and their justification. So you might think, well, you know, the fact that, you know, we say we know things um, like Krakas is the capital of Venezuela, even though these if we were pushed, we'd assign lower credence to than propositions that we clearly don't know, like uh, the ticket will will lose. Uh, just shows that this whole concept of knowledge is inconsistent. So, some formal epistemologists might be tempted by this. Some, I think, are a bit tempted by this, um, but. It seems that, you know, we shouldn't give up the concept of knowledge without a fight, or or, or rather at least uh, uh, agree that it, it's uh, an inconsistent or incoherent concept. After all, 
talk about knowledge is ubiquitous. Um, people, you know, constantly make claims about what they know and they don't know, uh, or what other people know and or or don't know. So it seems that our, you know, our, our, the our use of the concept of knowledge is ubiquitous, and presumably it's ubiquitous because it's useful. Um, so if we can avoid it, it'd be good not to just simply give up on it and and say that it's somehow incoherent um, or problematic. Um, I mean, there's also, for the formal epistemologist that's tempted to give up on the concept of knowledge, uh, there's a question about whether formal epistemology itself might actually stand in need of the concept of knowledge. Um, so there's a question when it comes to principles like conditionalization, which say uh, you should update on your evidence in a particular way. There's a question about what constitutes evidence or an agent's evidence, your evidence. Um, the most kind of obvious answer to what constitutes your evidence would be it's the things that you know, um, which introduces the, the the concept of knowledge. So so maybe the formal epistemologist needs that. Um, but that's an issue we'll return to later. Uh, so a fourth alternative would be to say that the lottery paradox somehow doesn't reveal an incoherence in the concept of knowledge, but rather reveals an incoherence in our concept of degrees of belief. Um, and so maybe we should just cease to apply the concept of degrees of belief. So you might think, well, you know, the concept of knowledge clearly makes sense. Um, we don't seem to be able to translate between knowledge and degrees of belief, uh, so it's the latter notion that should be rejected. So it might be that some traditional epistemologists are tempted by this, um, but again, it seems that um, it would be a drastic response um, because in everyday life and in scientific practice, subjective probability assignments are often made um so you know for instance um uh you, you know you you might for instance uh say how probable you think something is um you will bet according to how probable you think it is scientists will express views on the probability of certain outcomes for instance um the example i gave on the handout is that uh the earth's Average temperature will rise by more than two degrees centigrade in the next hundred years. Um, so, if you spoke to a climatologist, they're probably unlikely to say yes or no, but rather to give you some probability uh, or, or their credence uh, in that proposition. So, given that this uh, notion of degree of belief um is um where 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 we can think of degree of belief probabilistically is is fairly ubiquitous and embedded in everyday um thought and talk and also scientific practice um we shouldn't give up on that without a fight either now a fifth response says that the lottery paradox shows that there's an inconsistency between describing an agent's epistemic states in terms of knowledge and full belief and so on, the, the sort of concepts we might say of traditional epistemology, and describing them, on the other hand, in terms of degrees of belief and the concepts of formal epistemology on the other. And you might say, well, okay, each approach may be legitimate, but we can't use both together. So... Yeah, you're, you're sort of acknowledging that there's an inconsistency, but unlike in, in um, responses three and four, you're not um, leveraging that inconsistency into a reason to reject either the concept of knowledge or the concept of degrees of belief or credences, uh, but suggesting that maybe they're both legitimate, um, 
as long as we don't try and use them together. Now, on the face of it, this is maybe a puzzling response um, because you might think, well, if two different ways of describing the world, in this case, uh, epistemic states are incompatible, then presumably at least one of them must be wrong or false or inaccurate or otherwise problematic. So you might think, well, doesn't the fact that they can't be used together, the fact that they're incompatible with one another, you know, surely means that at least one must be rejected. So um, this might be a, is at least a prima facie reason uh, for being a bit sceptical about response five. Um, having said that, um, we'll look at a sort of relatively nuanced view um, that might tempt us to endorse five after all uh, later on in the lecture. Okay. Uh, a sixth response, I'm not saying this is necessarily an exhaustive list, but um, um, certainly it describes a lot of the, the responses that have been considered. Uh, the sixth response is to say, well, there's just some disanalogy between the lottery type propositions, for instance, your, uh, the proposition that your ticket isn't a winner, and propositions with similar probability, or maybe even lower probability, that we'd ordinarily claim to know, right? So maybe there's just some disanalogy. So suppose that um, the uh, my degree of belief that my ticket doesn't win the lottery is 0.99. Uh, suppose that is equal to my degree of belief that uh, Caracas is the capital of Venezuela. Um, I And I claim to know that Caracas is the capital of Venezuela, but I didn't deny that I know that my, lotter my lottery ticket doesn't win or won't win. Um, you might say, well... Um, there's a, just a disanalogy between the two propositions, which vindicates my claim that I know one but don't know the other. So this would be quite a nice alternative, uh, at least relative to some of the other options, if we can pull it off. Uh, and the question is, uh, obviously, what would that disanalogy be? So what I'm going to do in what follows is explore a relatively promising approach to um, specifying what a disanalogy might be, um, and that is uh, a, an approach to epistemology known as contextualism. Okay, so what is contextualism? So focus first on traditional epistemology, and some of you might have come across contextualism about knowledge uh, in classes on traditional epistemology, but uh, don't worry if you haven't, um, we'll, we'll introduce it now. So contextualist accounts of knowledge um, claim that in order for you to know some proposition A, you don't have to be able to rule out every single possibility in which A is false. So, for instance, a uh, contextualist might claim that in order to know that it's sunny in Bloomsbury, um, then you don't necessarily need to be able to rule out the possibility that you're a brain in a vat uh, being subjected to electrochemical stimuli to make it appear to you that you're in Bloomsbury looking out of the window and seeing the sun. Um, despite it's not being sunny in Bloomsbury. So basically, you don't have to rule out radical sceptical scenarios, for instance, uh, in order for it to be true um, uh, for your claim that you know that it's sunny in Bloomsbury to be true. But, I mean, what you do need, you do need to rule out some things, right? So you need to be able to rule out that the world uh, is a normal one, not a brain in a vat one. Um, except that it's raining, 
right? So this is a possibility that you are able to look uh, to rule out by looking out the window, um, assuming you're in Bloomsbury, um, and um, uh, uh, and so the idea is well, provided you can rule out those more normal sorts of possibilities, um, then you you do your your claim that you know uh, that it's sunny in Bloomsbury um, is true. Um, even if you can't rule out what might seem to be more far-fetched alternatives to it's been sunny in Bloomsbury. Okay, so in general the idea is that for it to be true that Agent S knows Proposition A, um, S just needs to be, rule, be able to rule out those possibilities in which A is false that are in some sense relevant. Um, so the, I the idea would be that at least most of the time the brain in that possibility isn't relevant, uh, but the one in which the world's very much like it appears, but in which it is in fact raining in Bloomsbury, that would be a relevant alternative. Now, specifically, contextualism says that which possibilities are relevant depends on the context in which the statement Agent S knows the day uh, is in. Um, now, uh, there are two sorts of claims, I suppose. So you might claim of somebody else, S knows the day, but you might also claim it of yourself, right? You, when you say, I know the day. Um, and in each case, the idea is that um, the person who utters this sentence, their context determines whether the sentence that they utter is true or false. Now, OK, so it's, to sort of understand contextualism a bit better, it's um, perhaps best to step back for a moment from considerations of knowledge, so epistemic considerations, and to um, note that there are other words besides the word no, uh, whose meaning seems to depend upon context. Um, and the claim of the contextualist is going to be that the meaning of the word no does too. So for instance, if someone says, um, just in an ordinary conversation, the earth is spherical, you'd presumably normally judge that to be true. But if you're at a, a geodesist's conference and the speaker's just pointed out that the earth is flattened at the poles and bulges at the equator, which is in fact the case, then it seems that in that sort of context, um, it would be false to assert that the Earth is spherical. So many people want to say in the ordinary context, one speaks truly when one says the Earth is spherical. But in this kind of unusual context of the Judicist conference, uh, it might sound wrong to say the Earth is spherical. Right. Um, so the idea is that, that the word spherical is um, that the exact meaning is contextually determined. So um, whether, uh, so there's a very strict, I suppose the one way to think about it is there's a very strict sense of spherical um, on which it's false that the world is spherical. And uh, that, that strict sense is the one in operation in the context of a geodesist's uh, conference. But a more relaxed uh, sense of spherical is the one in operation in the context of a, just an ordinary conversation. So, I mean, I guess for the motivation for this, imagine that in a, a more ordinary context, um, Someone says the Earth's spherical and the other says the Earth's flat. Um, in an ordinary context, it seems that we'd be pretty disinclined to say that both are wrong, right? We'd like to say that the, 
the 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 person who says the earth is spherical is is right and the one who says that the earth is flat is wrong uh just to give another example uh terms like tall and short seem to um have their meaning determined contextually so uh suppose that um uh you're with some friends at a zoo and there's a big herd of giraffes um one of your friends points to one that's a bit shorter than the others and says that giraffe is short well you know it seems plausibly that your friend has spoken truly but now suppose a different situation in which a giraffe of the same height um um is uh nowhere near any other giraffes but rather surrounded by people then in that context to say the giraffe is short uh, while it's towering over uh its neighbors um would seem odd and, and plausibly false so so again the idea is that the word short uh has its exact meaning um determined by context and so uh the truth value of claims like uh the giraffe is short uh is context dependent so contextualism about knowledge similarly implies that the exact meaning of the word no uh varies with context and consequently sentences of the form agent s knows that a have different truth values in different contexts and specifically the epistemic contextualist's idea is that the the reason um that the truth value shifts of that sentence across contexts is because which alternatives to the proposition A, are relevant, varies across those contexts. So, um, so for instance, the contextualist would say that in ordinary contexts, the claim, I know I have two hands, is obviously true. Um, but they'd say that, for instance, in the context of an epistemology seminar, when the possibility has just been raised that I'm merely a brain in a vat being deceived by a mad scientist, uh, to claim in that epistemology seminar just after that possibility has been raised, they'd say the claim, I know that I have two hands, is false. So the idea is that these two contexts are a relatively ordinary context and then the context of an epistemology seminar which possibilities are relevant differs and so the truth value of the sentence differs so the idea is that in ordinary context the possibility that i'm a brain in a vat isn't relevant and so we can ignore it whereas in the epistemology seminar where the possibility has just been raised it is relevant and so we can't ignore it um, so what differs across the contexts is not that there are different possibilities, right? I mean, it remains a possibility no matter what context you're in um, uh, that an epistemic possibility, um, something that you can't rule out, um, that you're a brain in a vat, right? You can't rule, you can't rule that out um, in either context. But what differs according to the epistemic contextualist, across the contexts is just whether it's relevant and so whether you have to be able to rule it out in order to truly assert, I know that I have two hands. Um, so Lewis, and this is a paper from the further reading list on this topic, um, defends epistemic contextualism. And he argues that uh, a rule that he calls the rule of attention is um, um, one of the the rules that guides which possibilities are relevant in a context. So the rule of attention says that if a possibility is salient in a speaker's conversational context, then it's relevant and so it can't be properly ignored. 
So, for instance, if the possibility that we're all brains in vats has just been raised in an epistemology seminar that we're in, then we're attending to that possibility. So it's not proper, properly ignored by those involved in the seminar. And the fact that it, we can't we can't properly ignore it by the rule of attention, um, and we can't rule it out, uh, means that it would be false in that context to say, I know I have two hands. On the other hand, in ordinary contexts, uh, where we're not attending to the brain in that hypothesis, um, even though we still couldn't rule it out, um, it is proper, uh, an alternative that's properly ignored. And so one can truly say, I know that I have two hands. So that's the, the epistemic contextualist approach. Okay, so how does all this relate, or how might it be related to the lottery paradox? So the paradox is if you remember, that it seems correct to say that I don't know that my ticket won't win, even though there are plenty of propositions that it seems correct to say that I know, even though they have the same or lower probability than the proposition that my ticket won't win. So, if you recall response six that we considered, there's a disanalogy Right, that the, the correct response to this is that there's a disanalogy between uh, the proposition that your ticket isn't a winner and propositions with similar probability that we'd ordinarily claim to know. Um, the contextualism, the contextualist approach provides a way of, of thinking about the disanalogy. So, specifically, consider the proposition that my ticket isn't a winner. Now, the, the very structure of a lottery tends to make, make salient the possibility that my ticket, in fact, is a winner, right? Just sort of whenever we think about lotteries, I suppose we're going to think about, you know, the fact that there's a winning ticket and a winning ticket is drawn. So it's very difficult to think about a lottery um, without attending to the possibility that one stick it wins. Um, and so according to Lewis's rule of attention, uh, the proposition that one stick it wins can't be properly ignored because you sort of pay attention to it. And if, you, if you're actually paying attention to it, then according to the rule of attention, it's not properly ignored. And it's in the very nature of lotteries to draw attention to these possibilities. And so, consequently, according to the contextualist, when I say I know my ticket won't win, I speak falsely because there's a possibility that's not properly ignored because it's immediately brought to attention. Um, and it's also a possibility that I can't rule out. Um, so... The fact that, that the possibility that my ticket wins isn't one that I can't is isn't one that I can rule out, and also isn't one that I can properly ignore because the very nature of lotteries makes it salient uh, means that it's false when I say I know my ticket won't win, which is kind of what we wanted, right? We we kind of you know, it's implausible uh, that when I say, I know my ticket won't win, I speak falsely. On the other hand, consider the proposition that Boris Johnson is prime minister, which might um, have a probability equal or even lower uh, than the proposition that my ticket won't win, just depending on the size of the lottery. Now, as we've said, in ordinary context, it seems true to say that I know that Boris Johnson is Prime Minister. Um, and 
as I say, even if were I pushed, I'd probably say the chance of his not being prime minister um, was greater than the chance of my ticket winning the lottery, provided it's a very big lottery. Um, now, how does the, the contextualist square the uh, apparent truth of the claim that I know that Boris Johnson is prime minister with the apparent falsity of the claim that I know uh, my ticket won't win, even though the, they, I assign them or would assign them equal credence if I were pushed to to specify my creed, creedal value. Um, well, the epistemic contextualist is just going to say, well, the possibility of Johnson's having resigned since I last watched the news can normally be properly ignored. It's not normally salient. Um, so even though I can't rule it out, um, it you know, in many contexts, it wouldn't be salient. Um, and, and so I can properly ignore it. And so um, I can truly say uh, that I know that uh, Boris Johnson is prime minister. Uh, in contrast with the lottery case, where the very nature of lotteries makes salient the possibility that my ticket wins. So, if contextualism is right, um, especially if uh, Lewis's rule of attention is right, then this suggests that, in while ordinarily it might be true for me to say, that I know that Boris Johnson is Prime Minister, it suggests that if someone raises to me the possibility that Boris Johnson has resigned since the last time I saw the news, so they might raise this possibility just by mentioning it as a possibility to me, or they might ask me what um, chance or what credence I think it has, which again might... Um, raise it as a salient possibility it might make us attend to it, then contextualism suggests that it will now be wrong for me to say that I know that Boris Johnson is Prime Minister. And that's because we're now in a context in which the possibility has been raised and so is salient and by the rule of attention isn't properly ignored. Now, I mean, I... I, this seems kind of plausible um, because, on the one hand, when we're not attending to the possibility that he's resigned since we last checked, we ordinarily would say that we know that Boris Johnson is Prime Minister. Um, but, you know, if, it, you know, if I'm attending to the possibility that he might have resigned since I last saw the news, it would certainly seem odd to say that I know that he's Prime Minister. It'd be very odd to say... I know Boris Johnson's Prime Minister, but he might have resigned since I last saw the news. Okay, so that in, in any case, that's what contextualism predicts. Now, I mean, it might be also, by the way, that there are certain contexts in which my ticket winning is properly ignored in the lottery case, even though those contexts might be few because of the nature of lotteries. So uh, on the handout, I give the example in which I've got an unchecked Euro Millions ticket in my wallet from yesterday's draw. Um, I So I haven't checked it. I've just forgotten that I've got the ticket. Although, you know, next time I sort through my wallet, I'll, um, I'll, I'll find it uh, and check it. And suppose, you know, while it's, temporarily forgotten about, I say, I know I'm not a millionaire. Then it seems that according to the contextualist, what I say might be true, because I'm not attending to the possibility that there's a ticket in my wallet that's a winning one. Um, and so this might be properly ignorable, even though I can't rule it out. So insofar as you find predictions like this plausible, you might find epistemic contextualism plausible. All right, so have we solved the problem then? So contextualism gives this kind of plausible account of the lottery paradox. 
Um, it sort of explains why ordinarily it would be false to say I know that my ticket didn't does isn't a winning one. Um, while on the other hand, it uh, is plausibly true to say I know Boris Johnson is the uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, even though um, these propositions might have the same credence if I were challenged to assign a credence to them. Um, but, I mean, so, although it can give the verdicts that we sort of wanted um, when it comes to our knowledge claims, it does, however, suggest that there really isn't a straightforward relationship between knowledge and degree of belief and credence, which is the question that we started out with. So, in particular, um, whether a claim, I know that P, is true in a context, doesn't seem to have any sort of straightforward implication about the probability or credence that I assign to P. So, Sometimes um, we'll get cases where the proposition P is something I assign a very high credence to, like the proposition I have two hands, um, although in some contexts it uh, will still be false to say I know that P, for instance, in the epistemology seminar when we're discussing brains in vats. On the other hand, sometimes P might be a proposition that I assign less high credence to, uh, for instance, that Boris Johnson is Prime Minister, and yet my claim I know that P might be true just because of the context. So, in other words, what matters for my assertion I know that P, in terms of whether it's true or not, is not the credence I assign to P and not P, um, or what credences I would assign if someone pushed me to, uh, but rather whether the possibilities are properly ignorable or not, uh, which just depends on the context. Now, I mean, it might be that the, pro the probability one assigns to P isn't completely irrelevant. So it might be that, you know, if you assign a very high credence to not P, then it would be false to say, uh, I know that P. So Lewis advocates something like this um, in what he calls the rule of belief. In um, So again, the details of that can be found in the, uh, the paper of Lewis's on the further reading list for this topic. But, but anyway, there's no straightforward implication from the truth of your claim that you know that P to the credence you assign to it or vice versa, uh, if we adopt the contextualist stance. I mean, there are also various kind of un questions, related questions that are left unresolved by this. So you might say, OK, let's suppose we adopt the contextualist view. Where does this leave the view according to which an agent's evidence is the stuff that they know? Right. Now, on a contextualist account of knowledge, this might lead to a bit of a mess, right? So what are we supposed to update on? If we're supposed to update on our evidence and our evidence is the stuff that we know, but the stuff that we can truly be said to know um, shifts depending on context, then we'll uh, suppose that we're in a context where we can truly say that we know um, such and such and then we update on such and such, what happens if the context shifts so it's no longer true to say that, that we know that thing? Are we to somehow uh, reverse conditionalize or something like that? It seems that uh, things might become a bit of a mess. So, I mean, I suppose you might say, well, OK, let's um, not take one's evidence for the purposes of conditionalization to be the stuff that one knows. Uh, let's have a more stringent standard that it must be stuff that you have credence one in. Um, 
And then you can just update on that Credence 1 stuff. Um, and probably, I guess, the, the Credence 1 stuff might count as uh, stuff you'd know even in the most stringent contexts. Um, what about then the uh, things that you might believe strongly but don't have Credence 1 in? Well, one response might be that uh, Jeffrey conditionalization is made for those sorts of cases. So, so maybe that's not the end of the world. Maybe, maybe um, we don't have to straight. Even if uh, so, maybe if we adopt a, a, a contextualist approach to knowledge, uh, we don't really need to just identify our evidence with knowledge um, for the purposes of our update rule. Uh, maybe we should instead identify it with the stuff we have credence one in. Um, but there's a sort of maybe a deeper issue here. So you might say, um, all right, so um, what we count as knowing um, this, so we have this traditional epi epistemological concept of knowledge. What one counts as knowing shifts depending upon one's context, um, because of um, because possibilities become salient or non-salient. Um, but one interesting possibility is that actually one's credence in something might also shift. Uh, when certain possibilities are raised that, that maybe had previously not been salient to one. So suppose that I'm a first-year undergraduate philosophy student. Uh, I haven't done much background reading. I go into my first epistemology seminar and the possibility that I'm a brain in a vat being deceived by a mad scientist is raised. Well, it seems that actually this might not simply um, affect my ability to truly say that I know that I have two hands, but it might indeed affect my credence that I have two hands, right? So I might have just sort of took it for granted before I encountered this hypothesis that I have two hands, and so my my degree of belief might be very close to one, very, very close to one, if not one. Um, and then this possibility is raised, something I've never even thought about before, and maybe my credence is actually lowered, and maybe it's lowered permanently. So this would be an interesting phenomenon because it involves a shift in credence that's not in response to evidence, it doesn't seem, and it doesn't seem that you've acquired any evidence um, when you went to the epistemology seminar, but rather it's in response to having discovered a new possibility um, that you haven't, haven't thought about. So either you discovered a new possibility or at least that possibility is made salient to you. Um, now, that doesn't seem to constitute evidence that that possibility is actual. Um, the possibility has barely been raised, and, and and yet that might lead you to shift credences. Um, now, so such a shift in credence that's not in response to evidence um, doesn't seem to be compatible with conditionalization. So I suppose one response to this might be that, well, you know, this might happen to ordinary agents, but if you're ideally rational, you would already know all of the possibilities. And so having someone mention one of them wouldn't shift your credence. Um, you'd only shift your credence in response to evidence. But again, this raises this sort of um, issue that's kind of been a theme of the course, which is, well, we're not ideally rational agents. Um, so if epistemology is going to be useful or significant to us, may maybe we should be doing the epistemology or formal epistemology of bounded, boundedly rational agents whose credences might shift 
when po unconsidered possibilities are raised, even though this shift isn't uh, a shift via conditionalization. Uh, a final interesting issue um, that uh, remains um, is that often talking about credences actually seems to undermine talk about knowledge. Um, and this is something that, I, you know, has been touched on in passing earlier on. So um, if, you know, if I say I know that Boris Johnson is the prime minister, and then you say, well, what's your degree of belief in that? Or what odds would you bet on that? at, um, then this kind of, um, unless I, you know, say my degree of belief is one, um, this sort of raises to me, uh, or makes, makes, uh, brings home to me that, um, you know, I don't have certainty in this proposition, that my degree of belief is in fact less than one. And that's because there are possibilities um, that I assign some positive credence to that are incompatible with Boris Johnson being Prime Minister. You know, for instance, the possibility that he's resigned since I last checked the news. Um, so as soon as we start thinking about credences, um, then it this, this sort of tends to... Um, bring into salience uh, contrary possibilities um, and so kind of undermine our, our knowledge claims uh, via the rule of attention. So actually this is when I said that I'd come back to a sort of nuanced version of, of option five, response five to the lottery paradox. Um, this might be a sort of reasonable um, version of response five. So response five said, the lottery paradox shows there's an inconsistency between describing an agent's epistemic states in terms of knowledge and full belief on the one hand and in terms of degrees of belief on the other. Each approach may be legitimate, but we can't use both together. Well, you know, the sort of contextualist approach um, might render this plausible. So you might think, well, you know, it's okay normally to think about uh, an agent as knowing things, or to talk about an agent as knowing things. But as soon as we focus on their degrees of belief, then this sort of automatically makes salient um, certain possibilities in which uh, what they believe is is false, you know, and the fact that they don't, they, they assign positive credences to these beliefs. And so, so maybe kind of the, the way of talking in terms of degrees of belief actually undermines uh, the uh, talk in terms of knowledge, so so maybe option five isn't isn't so bad after all. Okay, but um, yeah, I, I, you know, as with all our topics, this is a very much a, an ongoing issue. Um, discussion over um, contextualism is uh, is quite lively in traditional epistemology. Uh, discussion of the lottery paradox is is quite lively in formal epistemology, um, and there are you know um, uh, plenty of discussion of the the, the crossover between contextualism uh, and the, the and formal epistemology and 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 also various other possible solutions to the lottery paradox. So, again, um, in order to explore this further, uh, there are. Um, a number of readings on the further reading list for this topic, um, and I'd, I'd recommend those to you, especially if you're writing a summative essay on the topic. Okay, so that's it from me. If you have any further questions, obviously email me. Um, otherwise, I hope you're all staying safe and well uh, during uh, what's a difficult time, really, for all of us. Um, so best wishes, and uh, hopefully I'll see you all around soon.